Hello everyone, welcome to Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast, but also a YouTube channel for novice writers by novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. Welcome to another episode of Writer's Rants. We're back again to our usual schedule of a bi-weekly rant, so you won't be hearing much writing in the streets from us next week. Except for, of course, on the next podcast episode. And don't worry, we will still have a few goodies pop up here and there on our various uh, social media platforms. Maybe even something still over here on our YouTube channel. But, good rule of thumb for now, expect a rant every other week. Okay, so enough preamble out of the way. Let's jump right into this thing. Do you want to know what causes me to lay awake for hours, dripping in cold sweat? Do you know what causes me to throw the book I'm reading across the room, along with my granny and little children around me? Do you want to know what makes me want to run for political office? Love triangles! But do you know what gets my goat faster than a troll under a bridge? The fact that everyone misunderstands how love triangles are even supposed to be used! That's right, I'm about to take every single YouTube video you've ever seen on the subject, and every article you've ever read on the matter, and I'm going to throw them out with that garbage that your mother told you to get rid of last week. Love triangles have been used so often that they've become one of the most widely known tropes in all of literature. However, love triangles were never meant to be a trope, but rather a roadmap for character progression and plot development. That's right, it's time for you to stop thinking about them as a tool for driving drama and suckering thousands of romance-craving readers into buying your books. No, you have to respect love triangles as a means for developing characters and the overall story. Unless, of course, they are written absolutely terribly. <coughs> then you can continue hating them. Heck, I certainly do. We need to start looking at love triangles differently. For one, they belong to a much, much larger family of what I like to call the geometry of love. Let's address the obvious, but ever so important fact. In real life, our relationships with others do not boil down to anything as simple as a YA love triangle. Our lives are complex webs of acquaintances, long-lost friends, and close family members. Intimate friendships, work relationships, drinking buddies, passing flings, soulmates, strangers, and more. This is a part of what makes life so beautiful, and many times really crazy. As we work daily to balance these many relationships, we realize that love, as in capital L-O-V-E, is often nothing like what we read in books. This has caused many people to flat out say that love triangles are a load of moldy baloney because they don't exist in real world scenarios. The fact of the matter is that they do. But they are often messy and not a whole lot of fun to be in. Here are some examples of real world love triangles that I have seen and these include but are definitely not limited to instances such as where two boys are smitten with the same girl. But the girl has no interest in either of them, and quite possibly she doesn't even know they exist. And so they war for her affection, and she has no clue. And sometimes a girl strings along one guy to make the boy she's actually interested in jealous so that he will make a move on her. And sometimes you have a guy who's a total jerk, and he's playing both girls at the same time to see if he can get everything that he wants out of them. The thing, reason why we don't really see this in... Why a literature or in most romantic love triangles of any kind in, in the media is because they just they don't have that same satisfying drama and and rivalry between everyone that just makes us fall in love with them. Yeah, I know it sounds totally stupid when you say it that way, but yeah, that's how a lot of people treat unrealistic love triangles. But trust me, real ones do indeed exist. So allow me to explain further. A love triangle is when three different people, or as we can consider them the three points on a triangle, are all connected via the lines. They create an enclosed space around one particular area, namely that of their feelings for one another. This means that the examples as I have just uh, listed are indeed love triangles, albeit very messy ones. You rarely find these ones written because, as I said, they're just not as fulfilling to the reader as your traditional Twilight model. At the risk of carrying this shape analogy too far, let's think of the length of the lines as 
the kind of relationships that connect these uh, people together. The shorter the line, we could think of them as we could think of that as the closer the bond. The further away, the less connected these two characters are. That means that you can start working with a wide variety of interesting relationships. Um, you can have it where two best friends are going after the same guy, or three people are entirely worlds apart. I mean, go ahead, I'm giving this one to you. Write, a, write an interesting love triangle between three different alien species. Now, that would be pretty awesome to see. There are many different love triangles, just as there are many different kinds of triangles. And so it gives you a chance to really play with some interesting dynamics between just three characters. But this is really where my criticism of the love triangle trope comes in. Because there are so many variants of triangles and really so many different ways that we can approach just one relationship, let alone two. Why is it that the most common one we come across is a heroine who's obscure but alluring it pulls in the attention of the bad boy and the good boy and creates a boring equilateral bond where the only character development we see out of anyone is simply the chase to get the girl. But here's the thing, you can have so much more fun in a love triangle than just that. As I just said, like you can pull in real world scenarios or you can just go straight up out of left field and you can have them go wheel of time polygamist or Let's say that you actually want to be more realistic and have no one get together. Or even more fun than that, you can have a third party come out of left field and just say, I am the one that the heroine has been waiting for. And then she'd be like, oh my gosh, after spending time with these two guys, I actually now know the kind of man that I really want to be with. And it's definitely not these two. You, Mr. Third Party Candidate. So have some fun for crying out loud with these things. Don't just stick to the equilateral twilight trope. And here's the thing, if you are still lost for ideas of how to write a fresh love triangle, here are two that might inspire you. The movie While You Were Sleeping has a phenomenal love triangle. The girl Lucy, the main character, has a crush on the hot businessman Peter, who takes the train to work every day. Well, one day, because of circumstances, aka the plot, no, 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 not that kind of plot. Get those out of here. He falls onto the railway, and she has to save him. But when she saves him, it turns out that he's in a coma. So she takes him to the hospital. But in order to do that, she has to pretend that she's in a relationship with him, which gets interpreted that she's actually the fiancé. Well, when his family shows up, they are thrilled to find that there's such a good girl in the life of their little Peter. And they are just thrilled that their daughter-in-law-to-be is the one who saved their son. But the brother Jack... He comes in and he thinks that something's up, so he starts doing a little investigating into Lucy's life. Well, in the process, Jack and Lucy start falling for each other. But she feels that she can't betray the family because they all think that she's with Peter. And what's more is that Peter, though totally comatose for most of the story, gets pulled into this relationship because of how the family interprets his personal progression as being as, as being the man who's engaged to Lucy. Because they just say, oh my gosh, their, their personalities just complement each other totally. This, this down-to-earth, beautiful girl is exactly the kind of woman that Peter needs in his life. And so it's just really, really hilarious seeing how these relationships form when one of the people in the love triangle has absolutely no free will most of the movie because he's totally out of it. Then there's the really interesting dynamic between Dipper, Wendy, and Robbie in Gravity Falls. And this is a truly bizarre love triangle because at one point, Wendy and Robbie actually are together. But then they break up because Dipper goes and he proves that Robbie's basically trying to brainwash Wendy at one point. Really hilarious. And we just know from the get-go on that Dipper has fallen completely head over heels for Wendy. But even though there's one episode that kind of hints that it might have worked out... She has the good graces of letting him down. Um, so, you know, I'll just leave it to the fan fiction writers to figure out who on earth ends up with who in this story. But at least one thing that we do know at the very end is this. Hey, you mean a lot to me, man. You too. Something to remember me by. So by the end of the show, no one really ends up with anyone. The triangle has been dissolved, but they all part being really good friends. And that is a realistic and relatable love triangle right there. And that's the kind of thing that you really want to write. 
But enough of these love triangles. Let's get to the really good stuff. There are more shapes than just love triangles when it comes to the geometry of love. There are also squares, diamonds, rectangles, and so forth. This place is full of squares. <laughs> and yes, all of these act in the same way as the love triangle. Four people, just a few more connections, and who will end up with whom? Normally this dynamic is used by an author when he or she feels sad for having the third wheel not end up with anyone. So they create a fourth player, so that way the good boy or the get bad boy, usually the good boy who gets let down, has then someone to end up with that's totally perfect for them and everyone gets to live happily ever after. But aren't we better than that? Come on, people. Honestly, the love square is just too similar to the love triangle, in my opinion. But it does bring out the element of an extra character. Once again, as I said, we have to think about the love triangle and we have to think about these other geometric shapes more as roadmaps for the story and character progression than as a tool for driving the romantic drama. So in a way, it does, it does spice up your story more by adding in more interactions. And really, the more interactions you have the better your story becomes because there's so much more potential for great character conversations, miscommunications, um, wonderful subplots, things that just enrich the story and the lives of the people within your story overall. Um, but now then, really, where the fun gets is when we start adding in way more people. Because as I said, the more people that you add in, the more chances you have for things to happen. And probably one of the best... Um, forms uh one of the best shapes of the geometry of love is the love pentagram the key to any great drama especially a romantic one is to have miscommunications galore that drives the suspense the comedy and the great interactions and if you don't believe me just have a look at pride and prejudice that entire story is made up of miscommunications now then in the love pentagram we have five people which means we have got five different kinds of connections and really in a way kind of multiplies into even more as these characters really begin to interact and have as I said their moments of miscommunication and even their moments of genuine honest understanding with each other now that miscommunications do suck in real life but in fantasy we love it the show gamers is a prime example of this this wonderful romantic comedy centers on five teenagers who are all linked by their love for video games and also by their aspirations to date one another. Well, things get hairy really, really fast as each member of the group starts misinterpreting the actions and words of the others to mean totally wild and untrue things, um, basically based on what they think of this other person and what they themselves kind of want to get out of this love pentagram. And so even when they try to talk things out throughout the story, they just keep on misunderstanding one another and totally misinterpret the words and actions of, of what everyone's doing and the things that are going around them. Um, and so just everything gets totally blown out of proportion. And this builds up to when we finally get the absolutely hilarious scene in the classrooms where everyone just thinks that they know exactly what's going on but they don't, and it just leads to one of the best twists in the show. What if, when I spy on a goody, she's making some weird face at me, her dumb cheated on boyfriend? Ooh. It's like the teabagging after the headshot. No! Yeah, like things are going to get anywhere near that awkward for me today. <laughs> but what if Tosk looks at me to see if I'm looking at him when this whole thing goes? Checking on your poor girlfriend when she hasn't done anything wrong in the first place. You'd have to be the cheatingest cheater ever to do something like that. Hey, no way Tosku could be that much of a jerk, so no problem. Man, why did I get so clever thinking of all these possibilities? I'm even surprising myself with this stuff! Okay, self, here's another scenario. What if Aguri and Urehara look at each other strange during the k Tendo thing? If the two of them are an item, they're gonna freak out when he has to be friends with Tendo, because they'll see it as the cry for help it really is! <laughs> but that's enough doom and gloom without any proof. I mean, things couldn't get that horrible, right? For better or worse, the Tendo thing in class F will drag the truth into the light! <laughs> <laughs> So I, I know that that quick summary just doesn't do the show justice. Seriously, go check out Gamers. 
It is one of the best ways you could spend your day. Hey, and I can just only give it my best and glowing recommendation that you watch it as soon as you can because it is hilarious. And this right here is just romantic miscommunication at its finest. And I also just want to see what kind of shipping war ensues out of all of you after you watch this. <laughs> now, the shapes get more and more complicated from here on out. Remember, as I said, more characters you add, more connections, more chances for miscommunication, so on and so forth. And this is then where you really have to know what you're doing. Because once you kind of go back beyond five people, things just get really complicated. And the thing is this, is that if you decide to go this route, it pays off amazing dividends if you do it right. There's a fantastic payoff for playing off so many romantic pairings. And it's a really wonderful thing to see. There are shows and books that have done this really, really well. And then there are some that have crashed and burned hard. So I can understand the trepidation of many um, beginning writers to go beyond a love triangle. Because a love triangle is a tried and, a tried and proved method that is very marketable. And sometimes having eight different people together that are all romantically inclined towards one another, that just sounds really hard. And it's almost kind of hard to sell it sometimes to the masses. But once again... If you want to if you want to break away from this roadmap turn trope and go for something that is way more rewarding to write, you start adding in more characters. Finally, for the geometry of love, one of the things that I want to address is a very interesting concave shape, and that is namely the harem. Now, don't go running away just yet screaming bloody murder, because believe me, there are harem esque relationships in the real world. These are primarily where one person in a group brings everyone together and establishes the different kinds of friendships within that group. And that one person, so often, even if they're not the leader of the group, they just play a very important role in keeping everyone together. And a lot of people define their relationships within the group based off of their friendship with that one person. And so it doesn't even always have to be romantically inclined to create a harem-esque setting. I mean, you got to remember, we're Camille's harem, but we're definitely not having any sort of romantic connection with Camille. It's a very platonic bond. I see now that platonic friendship is one of the most beautiful loves of all. Now, harem stories are really hard to pull off satisfactorily, but it can be done. At some future point in time, one of us will have to address this in greater detail, whether it be through a rant or through a podcast episode. Man, I'm just really heaping stuff on us to discuss. I mean, I've got a discussion about the Fullbringer arc from Bleach, I've got an Adventure Time discussion to do, and now Harem Romance done properly? Oh boy. But don't worry, don't worry people, we will get to all of them, eventually. So... Just don't be afraid of writing harem-esque stories. They can be done, and they can be done well. But just the same as with love triangles, if you don't write them well, it's terrible. And please, please, please do not rut smut for smut's sake. That's just terrible. I've already given a rant about this somewhat more, but I will say it again. Do not write smut for smut's sake. That's just terrible. So to wrap this all up, Stop thinking about your romantic shapes as tropes, but as roadmaps for how characters interact and for how they are supposed to grow. I already talked about this in my last rant, that relationships are something that are meant to be matured. It's something you're supposed to take your time with. And that's really what, what you have to do with these, uh, with these geometric shapes of love. Um, you have to treat them as a roadmap. It's not an instant press the button and you've been teleported from point A to point B. You go along the lines of connection. Take your time with these characters, whether it be three to five to infinity and beyond. Take your time with these characters. Treat this not as a trope, but as a roadmap. And you will be rewarded with just amazing romantic plots and character arcs. Remember that miscommunications are a great way to actually develop characters, especially because miscommunications have to be overcome. And that pulls out so much of a character's personality, what kind of relationships they have with uh, the people within the shape, 
And so really focus on that when you're, when, when you're doing your geometric shapes of love. And really, at the end of the day, think about how your characters are supposed to grow and who they're supposed to become at the end of the story because of their involvement within this shape. They're all going on this adventure together, so don't leave one off to the roadside. Allow them all to develop over time. So, really, that's what you need to know about the geometry of love. And I guess I should end it with saying this, but really, it goes without saying, it is your characters that make a good romance. It's your characters that make the romance interesting, not the other way around. Poorly written people makes for ridiculous trash, not love. Huh. Who knew that Anakin had it right all along? Love can't save you. Only good writing can. Hmm. Food for thought there. Well, that's all for now. Remember to comment down below and subscribe so you can be in the loop for all our future content. And be sure to tune in for new episodes on our podcast. The link is down in the description provided. And head over to our Reddit, where we will have further discussions and information about upcoming events and contests. In fact, we actually have one going right now. You can go onto our Reddit page and check it out. It's about character building. You go and you do that, and you might have a chance to not only win a cool t-shirt from us, but also a guest spot on our podcast. And also check us out on Tumblr and Pinterest for fan art and inspiration. And finally, send us your links to those terrible, oh-so-terrible fan fictions via our Twitter at Camille's Harem, so we can do epic readings for all of your favorite bad stories. So until our next rant, or until the next podcast episode, juice.